Welcome to the Plant Cunning Podcast, where we explore a relationship to plants, other people, and the mysteries of nature. Coming to you from the High Allegheny Plateau in central New York, we are your hosts, A.C. Staubel and Isaac Hill. Hey, so today on the Plant Cutting Podcast, we have Michael Bryan, and he is an amazing astrologer, medical astrologer, yoga instructor, and he has just put out a new book called Mastering Traditional Astrology. It's pretty fun, but I do want to remind folks that if you want to come to the Plant Cutting Conference this September, and Matthew Wood, Kate Gilday, Pam Montgomery, Zamboni Funk, many other amazing speakers are going to be there. We're going to have music, we're going to have camping, we're going to have an amazing time. Uh, if you want to come to the Plant Cutting Conference, early bird tickets are still in effect for another week or two, so click the link below and sign up for early bird tickets. Okay, let's get to the episode. Okay, so today on the Plant Cutting Podcast, we have Michael Bryan, and Michael is an astrologer, author, teacher, yoga instructor, <laughs> he's done medical astrology, some Ayurveda, lots of stuff, and we're really excited to talk with Michael, especially since he's put out a new book, Mastering Traditional Astrology. So, Michael, how are you today? I'm doing great, Isaac, and thank you both, Isaac and AC, for having me. I'm super excited to be here, and I'm really looking forward to speaking with you. Awesome. So, how did you come to the planet path, Michael? Awesome. So, my astrology journey began at a very young age, and I'll tell you all more or less the condensed version, so we don't have to spend too much time on it, but I... At around the age of 11, 12, 10, I was always interested in magic and mysticism. And I think that for myself and for a lot of kids my age, we saw a lot of that on TV. So there was like Charmed and Captain mm-hmm. Planet and all of these all of these really interesting shows that were bringing back an awareness of magic. And while it was being done from more of a you know, Hollywood flashing lights perspective, there were still pockets or nuggets of information in shows like Charmed and even in Harry Potter and in all of these things that were going on that really pointed towards more ancient practices. And so I wanted to be a part of that world. I think that a lot of kids growing up in the 90s felt disillusioned and wanted to be a part of something bigger. And you had people like J.K. Rowling publishing books that presented a template for what bigger looks like. And Mm -hmm. so, I mean, I always waited for my Hogwarts letter to come to, you know, get swept up and go off and that never happened. And so I wanted to create that experience for myself and I wanted to give myself a magical education. And the Kabbalistic tarot came very early on into that. And that naturally led to traditional astrology because a lot of early 20th century Kabbalistic tarot, it derives a great wealth of its meaning from traditional Western tropical astrology. And so the the connections happened early. Once I opened up one thing, just other things started to open. And from the astrology and the tarot, in came numerology and the runes. And so I really built for myself at a very young age, a very eclectic training. And I my template for it was always Hogwarts and my template for it was always Harry Potter. And even though that's like stupid and strange, it still in my mind gave me a structured way of saying, okay, within my first year of studies, these are the things I want to learn and master within my second year of studies. These are the things I want to learn and master. So that by the time I was 16 years old, I was a fully functional reader. I I was giving full-on, full-fledged consultations and readings. And by the time as I was 18 years old, I was amazing at it. And by the time as I was 21 years old, I already had my professional practice. And so I'm I'm really grateful about my childhood and me building it in the way I built it. And my parents giving me the space and leaving me alone for the most part to do those things because I really was able to give myself the most incredible in-depth education in Western mysticism that I could have found anywhere. And still, as I look back on it today, I still feel as if I gave myself a pretty robust education. And so when I started to find teachers and I started to reach out to other people, I really reached out to them to fill spaces that I couldn't do for myself. And even even more than that, I reached out to people to observe how they practiced. So 
Yeah. I know, I know earlier before we went on, we were talking about a lot of the people who I studied with and trained with, but for the most part, I've, I've paid people money to sit down and watch them work basically, because I, I, by the time as I started to look for people to take me to the next level, I pretty much had a very solid foundation and I just wanted to look over the shoulders of somebody else to see how they did it. So everybody who I've ever studied with, like that has been the template of study. Let me give you a chart. Let me not tell you anything about this person at all. And let me see how you do it because I know how I would do it, but I want to see what you do. And I want to see if what you do is that different from what I do. And I mean, over the years, I've accumulated a lot of experience just by watching people in that way. And today I've built something pretty cool. And that's what I teach my students. Yeah, that's a really helpful way of doing it. So you were like self-taught and were you mostly using books at the time and just creating your own curriculum like as a yeah. team? <laughs> yeah, I mean, cool. I mean, so so I so I definitely was self-taught, but I think that for me, I always want to be able to practice things. And that's always been a part of my life. I, 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 I cringe at the thought of just being smart about something from a textbook level. I always want to know how to do a big yeah. part of my life is that I lived in Cuba and I went to dance school in Cuba. And so I had this very hands-on tactile education where there isn't a way to be a theoretical dancer. You have to know how to do. And so for me, being an astrologer and being a tarot reader and being a rune caster and doing all of these things, it was always based in this very real world, tangible, practical ability of how do I do this in a way that's provable to people? Because I think that was also part of my thing. I wanted to be able to prove it. I didn't just want to think it and, and, you know, speak to my other astrological colleagues and friends. I wanted to be able to build a practice that was provable. And so in my twenties, I started to do a lot of blind chart readings, like mm -hmm. live and public demonstrations of, of concrete event-based astrology. And that I kind of built a name for myself around that and a reputation around that, that, oh, you know, if you want to see astrology in action, go to Michael, cause he'll read your chart without any information. And that was cool for a bit, but now at this stage, I feel pretty content and that's not really how I do things so much anymore. I mean, I still do, but not that much. And I'm just in a place where I'm I'm comfortable with what I do and how I do it. And I'm comfortable with how I've seen other people do what they do so I can see what parts of their practice feel similar to mine and also what things I'm okay not doing. And I think it's all beautiful. What is your practice like right now? Like what, what do you do on the day-to-day? -day? Isaac mentioned you wrote the book recently. So yeah, can you describe to our listeners a little bit about your practice? Yeah, so on the day, to, so this is the book by the way, Mastering Traditional Astrology. I'll send you all a copy if you don't already have a copy. So it's huge. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. <Thank you. laughs> You're very, very welcome. But my practice on the day-to-day -day is one, I, I, have, I have like a bulletproof, client commitment so I always see clients and I never don't see clients and I think that that is something that I am grateful for because when I was a kid in the Bahamas I was the only person who I knew about and who anybody really knew about who was practicing these things at a quote-unquote professional level now once again I was still completely self-taught at that point but I had so many clients as a child and Looking back on it, I mean, you know, there are like ethical things of whether or not I should have should have been <laughs> giving readings to people at like 13 years old, but whatever. I had so many clients <laughs> as as a, as a baby, basically, and people, adults would come and bring me their deepest, darkest challenges. And I was 13, 14, and I, I grew up with that. And, and that is where I continue to root my practice today, because the only reason why I can do what I can do at the level that I can do it is because I never stop seeing clients. I see a lot of astrologers who, you know, they have, they put out their shingle that says, uh, you know, books are closed until further notice. And I just don't understand that because as an astrologer, our craft has always been a hands-on one. There is no, my books are closed, but I'm still an astrologer because our practice is a practice. And so that's my number one thing. I, I always see clients. I'm either in the process of seeing a client, just saw a client or preparing to see a client. Wow. I think that that's how, that's how it, it's, it's a magical craft, but it's a craft all the same. And if you're not sharpening your craft 
you're definitely losing it. So that's my big thing. Um, I teach as well. Uh, I teach yoga every day, which is kind of an excuse for me to practice yoga every day because I tend to be uh, a clusterer or a, a, like I'm a hive sort of person. I can do things by myself, surely, mm -hmm. but I rather do things as a collective. And so 100%. I agree with that. <laughs> it's a great way to make sure you're doing yoga every day. <laughs> exactly. So, so, so that's how I keep it up. So that's how I keep up my Iyengar yoga practice daily. My students come and I push them, but I'm pushing myself because I'm practicing with them. I What's the other thing that I do? I teach astrology every weekend. I teach six hours on Saturday, six hours on Sunday. And so that's my life. And then between all of that, I'm working on writing my second book because this is just volume one. And so the second book is technically supposed to be done by the beginning of September. And it's going to be published by the end of October. So that's my wow. plan right now. That's wow. that's intense. Yeah. So Very cool. what are your big three and why is popular modern astrology reductive? <laughs> that's, a, that's a very great question. Okay, so I'm going to tell you that my son is in Taurus and that's all I'm going to say because I never actually tell people okay. my chart. And, <laughs> and 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 so I'm, I'm saying my son is in Taurus because everybody knows I'm born on International Star Wars Day. I'm born May 4th and so that's the thing. So <laughs> may, may the fourth be with you. But, Love it. <laughs> but, but in, in general, you know, one of the things... I think because of the type of astrology I practice and there's a video floating around. I mean, there's videos on my YouTube channel, but there's also a video I recently did for the NCGR, which is like the one of the big astrology organizations in America. And they had me last week do a live demonstration, a blind chart reading live demonstration. And I mean, when I do a demonstration, I do everything. I talk about you. I talk about your money. I talk about your first brother, your second brother, your third brother, your father, your mother, your sister, your everything, your husband, your cat, your everything. And because that's the type of astrology I practice. And I built that based on my years of studying Geotish as well, which I think is the model for how we should be practicing astrology in the West. Because I think that in Geotish, they've never lost that that concrete component of being able to use a chart as a template of speaking about everybody within your life. And so because I know that, because I do that, because I do that sort of astrology routinely, and because I teach my students to do that routinely, and I demonstrate that sort of astrology every single weekend, I'm, I'm, I don't share my chart because I know, I know what I can say to someone from looking at their chart once. And even though I know that a lot of people can't practice or don't practice in that way, I still, I just don't like the thought of it. And I think like, I'm complete rambling, but I also think that when I speak to a lot of older astrologers, Judith, for example, we spoke about Judith and one of my favorite astrologers in the world is Faith McInerney and Ronnie Gale Dreyer, who is also a, she practices Geotish. When I speak to a lot of older astrologers, I hear them saying, you know, I really wish that when I was younger, I wasn't so flippant with my charts. And I really wish I hadn't given my chart out to so many people. But you can't take it back now because it's already been in circulation for the past 40 years. But for me, I've just I've just never done that as a practice. So I'm a Taurus. <laughs> I have my son in Taurus. <laughs> okay, so there was a second part to your question. What was the second piece? Well, the second piece was why is modern popular astrology reductive? <laughs> Yeah, so modern pop modern popular astrology for me is reductive because you know in the early 1900s, and I'm I'm actually really contemplating this question a lot because the second book starts with this rampage. It's not a rampage against, but it, it's a rampage against one person. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. But it's it's really a, about Alan Leo. Alan Leo oh. in the early 1900s, he set up this this thing of the sun moon and rising as an astrological template and then that spread throughout london and that spread throughout the world because london was really the template of astrology in the west for a very long time and so from alan leo we have people like charles carter and then evangeline adams and well not and then evangeline adams but all of these people really just mushroomed out with that sort of astrology and so we we end up with a very sign-based orientation to astrology in the west and and i i think that that's just it when we divide the world into those 12 discrete signs it's 
it, it, it sets us up for people to throw rocks at us. You know, it's, it's impossible yeah. to divide the world into 12 signs of the Zodiac, which I think is the scientific art is one of the scientific arguments against astrology. And when we look at astrology from the 13th century, the 17th century, really up until the late 1800s, our astrology has always been very planet based. So if we were to take someone, a modern astrologer from today and transplant them into the 1400s with them talking about, you know, my South node is my this past life and my Pluto did this to me and whatever, like, they'll be unintelligible because that's just not how we've ever spoken astrologically. We, we, we speak planetarily and astrology is this understanding of the combinations of planetary influences and we speak more about my venus is in the square with my mars and therefore as opposed to my moon is in scorpio and therefore so so for me i just tend to not practice astrology in that way and i know a lot of great astrologers who tend to practice with more of a sign-based emphasis and so i'm not saying that it's invalid i'm just saying that Every time I've seen someone try to publicly demonstrate astrology, they try to do so based on speaking to a person about the signs of the zodiac that their sun is in or their Mercury is in or that their Venus is in, and they fail. I mean, there's like so many videos on YouTube of people trying to prove astrology by using sign-based language and failing utterly horribly because our astrology is so much faster than that and if we're ever going to prove astrology to anyone we need to be able to speak in a more planet-based way because that's where the nuanced understanding of how a chart works comes from as far as i'm concerned at least well yeah i mean it also is just so much more complex than you know your son is in this but yeah. another thing about this book like you you have like one of the foundational aspects of astrology is essential dignity and debility you know mm -hmm. and that is kind of based on the sign so that is important too like if your moon is in scorpio it's going to be debilitated so how does that aspect form your part your, inform your practice and what is the importance of the the different divisions too because we usually think of in, just in terms of the the 12 zodiacs but there's also you know triplicities and mm -hmm. terms and decans and in the in geotish there's you know up to 60 or more divisional charts which are, are kind of based kind of the same thing but how does that that inform your practice essential dignity plays a very big part in my practice and and so i hear your question but it, it plays a big part in my practice from the perspective of how planets operate and from the perspective of how strongly a planet is empowered to operate. So, for example, I don't qualitatively interpret the moon in Scorpio as meaning anything, and neither do any of my students at the Oracular School of Astrology. However, quantitatively, the moon in Scorpio has less power to act because Scorpio is a sign of the moon's fall. So instead of me thinking moon in Scorpio, I think about moon in her fall and what does any planet in their fall operate like what does any planet in their domicile or their their sign operate like what does any planet in its detriment operate like without necessarily bringing in this notion of your venus is in is in aries therefore you're going to love passionately no talk to me about me loving passionately because my venus is in a square with Mars. I keep on bringing up the Venus Mars example, but talk about me loving passionately because my my Venus is conjunct the ruler of my ascendant. Talk about my passions because my Venus is conjunct my ascendant. Don't talk to me about my passionate love because my Venus is in a sign of the zodiac. Because I think that we miss we miss a big part of how to interpret when we lodge our interpretations deeply on the signs of the zodiac. It's a, it's a very complex topic and I, I don't want to bore anyone but I mean I just I just had a, I just had a client a couple of weeks ago who is in the year four of an astrology program here in the west and in year four she's a senior student in that program and she spent she kept on trying to drag me into signs of the zodiac based conversations about her son being in this sign and she doesn't understand how to reconcile that with her ascendant being in this other sign and it's it's for me a very mind numbing conversation because i don't practice astrology that way i i do not under i do not try to practice astrology based on talking to people about 
there are signs of the zodiac because I just think that it's it's missing the boat. And so anyway, I mean, I gave her the reading. The reading was fine and everything, but but the but we as astrologers collectively we have the signs of the zodiac language in spades. What we need to focus on developing more is understanding what does it mean for the moon to be conjunct Saturn versus the moon square Saturn and how does that impact the house the moon rules versus the house Saturn rules like that's really where the nuance of our craft is not necessarily an understanding definitions for the signs of the zodiac once again that's just me but I, I feel pretty confident about that yeah and it's the the signs are more important to show how that planet is going to be operational. Yeah. Yeah. So and that makes a lot of sense too. So I am interested also in talking about your book and you're going back through the whole 2000 plus years of Western astrology, you're condensing it. And this is only the first volume, so you're going to do more. But what are you including and what are you excluding? So what does traditional Western astrology mm -hmm. mean to you? Are you yeah. The West, like Hellenistic, Arabic, like medieval Renaissance, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in in terms of like, like I, so early I had mentioned to you and AC that in this in this book, I, I really wanted, well, I don't even know if I mentioned it, mentioned it, but in this in this book, I really wanted to make a practical tool that people could use, you know, and I think that there's a lot of traditional astrology that isn't practical and that isn't usable. And yeah. <laughs> and and yeah, I, I think I think the only people who think that every part of traditional astrology is practical and usable are people who don't meet with clients. And so for for me, I wanted to strip away all of the things that don't actually factor into client practice because I wanted to make a useful book. One of the things that tends to be a habit in terms of traditional astrology, as we call it in the West, is people tend to write books for each other. And what I mean by that is you have astrologers writing books to impress their astrological colleagues, which has never been a motivation of mine because I personally don't care about the opinions of my astrological colleagues that much. I mean, it's whatever, but I know that I practice good astrology independent of whatever. So I, I think that that was a very big thing for me. And as I look at a lot of books that my colleagues write, it's just inaccessible. It's inaccessible. And when you write an inaccessible book and you intend for that book to be a beginner's book, you're basically, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to swear, but you're, you're basically not a, a, a nice person. You're not a nice person because you're not thinking about the people who are going to pick that book up and read it. So when I go on Amazon, for example, and I read the reviews of some of the books that my other colleagues have written, it's like people say, you know, it's a very dense read, it's an encyclopedia, it's a this, it's a that, but, but not necessarily speaking about this book made me a better astrologer. And I wanted for my book to make people better astrologers. And I wanted for my book to be a level zero textbook for people coming into astrology for the first time who had no astrological background. And I wanted them to be able to pick up this book and train themselves to become an astrologer from level zero all the way up to the end of level zero, really, because this is the volume one. So this is literally all of the foundational things you need to know. And then after that, the next book that I'm working on now is the book on horary astrology. And then the next book is going to be natal astrology. And the next book is going to be on predictive astrology because I'm laying out a curriculum. One of the one of the things is that I have a background as a teacher. That's one of my professional backgrounds. And my mom, she used to make curriculums or build curriculums for teachers all her life and all of my childhood. So I've I've been in this household with teachers for basically my entire life. My aunt was a teacher. My grandmother was a teacher. So I've lived around teachers. And so I know how to build a curriculum. I know how to build a course of study. I know how to teach someone how to do something from the beginning to the end. And I think that that's one of the things that sets me apart as an astrological educator, because I actually know how to teach. And so in putting this book together, I put this book together as a course of learning so that people who pick this up can self-teach themselves. And one of the things that people have continuously said to me is that it anticipates their questions. And the reason the book anticipates their questions is because I didn't write this book in a vacuum. I wrote this book for my students. And so I know the questions that people ask when they have no astrological background. I know the questions that people ask when they have 30 years of an astrological background, but still have holes within their practice. So it's a really great book. 
I love it. And I, and people have been loving it too. Great. That's, that's awesome. So in this, in this synthesis, but also refinement of, of, of traditional astrology, what are your, what are you using for like house systems, for instance? So like there's the huge, you know, huge debate. Are you using both whole sign and quadrant? Are you using just quadrant or just whole sign? <laughs> okay. So, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, once it, going back to the notion of me not caring about what my colleagues think, I can answer that question <laughs> if you want me to, but do you really want me to? Yeah. I want to know, I mean, you're a practicing astrologer. You're, you're seeing how this, how these systems work in operation. And I think everyone, everyone has their own opinion and, and, and maybe different house systems work better for different people too. And I see the value of both how, and there are other house systems as well. Yeah. Uh, but you know, well, yeah, like what, in your experience, what works the best and what do you use? Okay. So I teach a lot. A lot of the astrology that I teach is based between the 13th century and the end of the 17th century. And if you're practicing 13th century astrology, you technically could or should be using Regio, not Regio Montanus, you could or should be using Alcabicious, which yeah. was a house system that was popular then. And if you're practicing in the 17th century, you technically could or should be using Regio Montanus. I've chosen to use the Regio Montanus house system because that's the house system that's appropriate for the period of time within which I practice. I've never used whole sign houses in my life. I can't imagine a reason for ever wanting to use whole sign houses. I only know one astrologer on the entire planet in the face of the universe who uses whole sign houses, who has a practice that I actually respect because that astrologer has been able to show me that she is amazing at that. And that's Judith Hill. And she doesn't even use it religiously because of some very deep argumentation within her she just uses it because it's what works within her practice she doesn't use it to put somebody else down she uses it because it's what works for her and right. i appreciate and i appreciate that and once again she's the only person who i know and i know many people in the astrological community and she's the only person who i know who's been able to demonstrate that whole sign houses not not even that they work, but that she's been able to demonstrate concrete event-based astrology using that. I use Reg. I know great astrologers who use Placidus. Nicholas Smuts also, I think, is the greatest fertility astrologer in the West in the in, in human existence. And she uses Placidus. And I think that's fine. She's figured out a way how to make that work for her. One of the things for me coming to astrology also as a magical practice is that I acknowledge that even though there's a technical part of what we do as astrologers. There's also a very magical and divinatory part of what yeah. we do as astrologers. So if you agree, if you make a pact with the divine that you're going to use Placidus houses, then that's the house system that the divine is going to speak to you through. If you make a pact with the divine that you're going to use Willy Wonka's house system, then that's the house system that the divine is going to speak to you through. I know that a lot of people have said that they use both whole sign houses and sometimes Placidus houses and sometimes equal houses. And it just sounds for me like a recipe for confusion because we can't really reconcile the fact that in Reggio Montanus, your ruler of the ascendant is in the first house, whereas within whole sign houses, the ruler of your ascendant is in the 12th house. I mean, that the, 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 I haven't found anyone who's been able to do that in a way that's skillful or that makes sense. And then I also think that it isn't even something that we need to be skillful at, because for me personally, using one house system is enough. I don't have the sort of curiosities that people have that drive them to use multiple house systems, because I practice very accurate event-based astrology and if and I, I feel no deficit within that and if I did feel a deficit then maybe I'd be more exploratory but the astrology I practice is pretty accurate it's pretty spot on and I only use one house system and I'm I'm very comfortable doing that and I'm also very comfortable teaching that to my students as well cool yeah that's respectable I guess so I, for instance Judith, Judith Hill it seems you know it works really well for her because of the way she uses the zodiacal man and like the planets going through different zones of the body and so on. And in that way, I can see like whole house might be better for certain techniques 
And then like, for, but I, I practice, you know, magical elections and mm. I'm not going to use whole sign houses for magical elections ever because the, the MC, the AC, the IC, the D, those are, the, mm. that's what it's based on, you know, how mm -hmm. close the planet is to, to those corners. Mm -hmm. So it, it really, to me, it's about tech, about what technique you're using. Cause, and there's some like in, in Geotish, there are certain techniques you just, you use whole sign house for. But I also I take your point very, very well that what you use works really well for you and you've seen it demonstrated time and time again. So why, why do anything mm. else, <laughs> you know? I mean, but, but just, just to, to ask, to ask the two of you in terms of, I mean, I know that the, the, that the herbalism is a very big part of, of what you do, but in terms of your practice, I mean, do you AC? Do you you do you have a, a a foot in the whole sign houses or in the any house system argument or or how does your practice look? I I'm not an astrologer, so I just stick with the herbs. And Isaac's been studying the astrology more so, so I don't have a strong opinion about the whole sign houses. But it is really interesting to hear yours, and I appreciated what you said about not confusing the divine too of like sticking with something and and running with it because that can get a little murky when you start to pull from so many different things yeah i mean i mean so for for me in terms of my my definition of divination is that divination is establishing communication with the divine via specific symbolic language and so when it comes to when it comes to Tarot, for example, I've chosen to speak with the divine via a very specific tarot deck, via a very specific mm -hmm. system within that. And the same thing is true for astrology. Like I've made an agreement with the divine to speak to the divine using Reggie Montana's houses. And that's kind of my pact. And so I'm I'm not going to personally throw in a monkey wrench one day and give somebody a reading using using alcobicious or porphyry or coke or placidus or whatever because that's not the agreement i've made with the gods essentially so i mean that's that's just my personal opinion i know that everybody has a different opinion about the about the houses thing and it's it's a great thing to be in like when i go on facebook and i look at the the I mean, I'd say Facebook, but when I go on the internet and I see the various arguments people have in like the traditional astrology groups and people talking about my house system is bigger than yours and my house is bigger. <laughs> yeah, it's a big it's just a very it's, it's, just, it's just a stupid argument. And it's and I mean it it's like you know, practice the astrology, work with clients, help people heal, help people figure out their lives. And let's just focus on that, not necessarily the houses. Yeah. Yeah. So from a beginner perspective of astrology, do you think that someone can self-teach themselves astrology? Like you kind, you kind of did that from a young age and you did find, you know, some teachers to, to see how they practice, but, or do you think at this point, there's enough really great teachers in the world that we should just like go and study with a teacher? I think that's a great question. And this question came up for me initially when I was speaking, so I teach Iyengar yoga as well. And, and I became certified when I was like 23 or 24. And at the time I was the youngest Iyengar yoga teacher in America. And I did that by having direct contact with one of the top two Iyengar yoga teachers in America, Dr. Lois Steinberg. And so my understanding of being in apprenticeship has really been based and built on that Iyengar yoga model because it's one of the traditional schools of yoga practice and that whole you know master student relationship is important and then the, and so I was everywhere with Lois I would go to Brazil with Lois and Washington with Lois and every single place Lois would go I was there with her and everybody knew it was the Lois and Michael show and I, I loved it because I loved that connection with my teacher and then the pandemic came and that had to stop you know it just had to stop as a as like a full stop. And I mean, sure, there were still classes online, but it was different. And I spoke with someone with a senior Iyengar yoga teacher in Italy, David Maloney. And, and we were having this conversation about, you know, being in studentship and having a teacher and all that stuff. And he was like, Michael, you know enough yoga <laughs> at this point <laughs> to advance your practice by yourself. And you know the things that are flawed within your practice. 
you have enough sensitivity to feel within yourself and to know how to adjust and self-adjust basically. And so wonderful. That's that's one side of the camp that, you know, I believe that having a teacher up until a point is important. But then after that, like, you know, enough of anything to be able to know how to avoid certain potholes. However, specific to astrology and not even however, but I think specific to astrology, I came up as a completely self-taught astrologer until I couldn't anymore. And that's when I reached out to to people and I and. I reached out to people. The first person I reached out to, it was because I wanted to take an exam. There's a particular exam in America, well, not just in America, but there's a particular exam called the NCGR, Professional Astrologers Alliance exam, and I wanted to take that. So I reached out to someone to teach me how to do that. When I wanted to really advance myself in horror astrology, I reached out to someone to take me beyond where I couldn't take myself. But I do believe that if that as better books get written, people have more ability to teach themselves. And I really don't think that you need anyone to teach you anything, which is rich coming from me because I have a two-year diploma program to teach people <laughs> how to be astrologers. So I mean- Well, some I, people need the teacher. You know, some people aren't the good self-motivated students, you know? That is true. And I think within the context of when I look at myself in the role of teaching, what I offer my students is a clear path to being created what they do in a very short space of time because they don't have to meander and they don't have to wonder and they don't have to fall into the potholes because I tell them what the potholes are. And, and I think that that's a really great thing to be able to have someone lead you specifically step by step and say, this is what to do, this is what to do, this is what not to do. But not everybody's gonna choose that path. And I think that if you are practicing astrology and you have great books and you have great resources and you have a client practice and you're making mistakes and learning from those mistakes and no longer making those mistakes, I think that you're fine to, to build your practice by yourself. Mm -hmm. Awesome. It's good to hear. Yeah, that's, that is. And I think one helpful thing about the teacher, there are two main helpful things for, from my perspective is one filling in gaps that you aren't aware of. Once you have those gaps, then you can work on that yourself. And then two, as you were saying, seeing how they do things and like getting yeah. that, like, it's kind of a transmission that you can't, it can't be transmitted through written word because you're mm -hmm. seeing how they actually react to something, how they're putting it in practice. And that's mm -hmm. why examples in books are gr so great, but mm -hmm. it still doesn't capture that, that, that. Yeah, it helps you overcome the self-doubt too. Cause if yeah. you're in your own little bubble of like, this is how I do things. And then you're like, wait a second how does this person over here do it? Yeah. A glimpse into that is really helpful to be like, okay, I'm good. Or, oh, I could do this better. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think another thing with astrology, so I completely agree with all of that because I once, once again, I'm not trying to go out of business. And, and so, <laughs> so I, I have, a, I have a school, I teach astrology and that's what I do. That's like my, my job job, but also I don't really have an attachment to astrology from a money-making perspective, even though that's how I make my living. I, I teach because I realize that what I teach for a lot of people is necessary. And I realize that within the astrological arena, there's many ways to get lost and many ways to get confused. And I have people who study with me who've been practicing astrology for 30 years and have never read a chart because they feel they've fallen in all the potholes and they feel like I've never been taught systematically step by step what to do until I found you, Michael. And so that's one group of people. But I also think it's important for people to know that everybody who teaches astrology today at some point in time has been self-taught. And if they've not been self-taught, the people they've learned from has been self-taught because we haven't had a tradition of learning astrology in the university for a very long time, for hundreds of years, at least 500 years, we haven't had that. So there has, so at some point, even if you learn from someone who learned from someone who learned from someone, the person they learn from has been self-taught. So this, this narrative of needing a teacher is something I subscribe to because I teach and I think I teach in a way that people need, but also I acknowledge that I'm just a bloop within a much larger thing of within a much larger tradition where I've charted a path for myself, but it's a path that many people before me have charted without having a teacher. And many people before me have charted by doing it themselves. And some of those people are some of the greatest astrologers I know today.
Mm, yeah. yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things that attracts me about the Jyotish too, though, is that they have had that unbroken tradition. And so it's it's because there is there is also like it takes a lot of time to to study things yourself and like go j- fall in all these potholes and so on and fa- false these mm. false doorways and so, <laughs> but they're they're also like I mean I, I don't know if you believe in past lives but you it's also something you may have been doing pre you know for Seems many like many, li- <laughs> many lives so somebody just coming to it fresh it's it can be very yeah. helpful to have like you know this is where th- this is where you go and this is what you do yeah um, yeah and, definitely and, and in this line from your perspective what should an astrologer know how to do and where are the biggest blind spots you see in astrologers <laughs> these days mm. right. that's that's a great question i think the first thing an astrologer should know how to do is read the chart <laughs> <laughs> and i mean i mean that i know that that seems rather self-explanatory or rather obvious but it's it's amazing for how many people that isn't obvious. Like I, I went out for for lunch the other day with someone and it was the conversation was so was so technical and it was technical in in very large wafting ways that was very expansive. And in my mind, I was just thinking, you know, do you even see clients? Like, do you have a client? Practice? Like, do you work with people? Because what what I find is that a lot of people, especially younger people, and I dare say astrologers in their early twenties, they have this this for whatever reason they're all enamored by Hellenistic astrology. And I know what the reason is why they're all enamored by Hellenistic astrology, but they're all into ancient Greek astrology because that's the new fad at the moment. And they're they're all very, very, very technical in ways that that for me just destroys the magic of actually performing a miracle for someone. Mm, yeah. That, and that is what I think we do as astrologers. We hold a very real thread of being able to show people that miracles still exist. And I prefer to practice there. I prefer to that's just the most stimulating part of it for me. So I think that the very first thing we need to focus on is being able to read charts and read charts well. One Someone once told a student of mine that to be an astrologer, all you needed was an English degree, a background in psychology and knowledge of mythology, basically, which is, you know, it's completely knocking futz because it's like, why would you who says that, you know, that you that, because there is no astrology within that definition. And But when you listen to a lot of people at conferences giving talks, that's what it seems like. It seems like, wow, this person is a great wordsmith. This person is a great psychologist. And this person is has a great knowledge of mythology, but this person knows no astrology. So I think that knowing how to read charts and knowing how to demonstrate that is the most important thing in the world. Because when the world calls on the astrologer, the very first thing is... Can you read this chart that we put in the front of you? And if you can't do that, then you really, like, what are you doing? You know, so my first thing is astrologers need to know how to read charts. I think once again, Geotish is a great template for how Western astrologers should be. Because when I study Geotish, my teachers weren't just specialists at medical astrology or horary astrology. They did medical and horary and electional and mundane and natal and sinistry and predictive and everything. Because within Indian culture, the role of an astrologer is more diverse and nuanced. And the astrologer in India needs to be a more holistic creature than astrologers in the West. Astrologers in the West have gotten sucked up into certification culture. So I'm going to go to this person to learn horary astrology and get a certificate. And I'm going to go to this other person to learn medical astrology and get a certificate. And it's it's kind of silly for me because at no other point in our history have we been so so schismed within ourselves. Mm-hmm. We've, we've, we've always done everything until the year 2000. And so I think that astrologers need to be more holistic. You're not just a natal astrologer. And if you are, go and learn something else. Go learn medical, go learn horary, go learn electional, go learn mundane, learn everything because your role as an astrologer is to be a holistic member of an evolving global culture. So 
those are the main two things I think that, well, and the third thing which I already spoke on is we need to understand more about how planets interact with each other. What do the, what does the combination of two planets do versus what does the combination of those two planets and the third planet do? We need to speak a more planetary language because that's far more nuanced than knowing what things an Aries person likes or doesn't like. And so I think that we need to move away from talking about signs of the zodiac in general as a community, especially if we're trying to get more established or recognized or respected, we have to be able to present to the world at large a more nuanced understanding of what astrology is and what it does. And I think that those three things, becoming more holistic, speaking more planetarily, and knowing how to read charts and knowing how to do that well, I think that those three things are really what we should be focusing on as a community. Yeah, I think that's so important. The practice is well, you keep emphasizing the practice because that is where the rubber meets the road. And that's mm -hmm. where you get direct feedback if whether or not your techniques are working or not. Yeah. And the same with herbalism, same with anything. It's like the practice of it is is where you actually get, gain the real experience, mm -hmm. not just the theoretical experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So something you said just now was as astrologers, we are showing people that miracles still exist. And I really like that. And I was wondering if you could give us an example of someone that you've worked with where they left your your reading feeling like, wow, miracles still exist. Like, <laughs> how have you like helped someone to change their life? Great. Awesome. So the in the book, I give an example of a lady. I mean, it's I'll just pull from some. I gave an I gave an example of a lady who came to me for a reading. It was a public demonstration. And one of the things I said was that her mother might potentially have liver issues today that might be connected to her mother's father's alcoholism. And she was like, wow, yeah, my mother completely has liver health problems and her dad was completely an alcoholic. Wow. And another person who I gave a reading to very recently at the at the thing I did for NCGR the the live demonstration I said to the lady that her that she has a complicated relationship with all three of her siblings and I was able to describe what the major complication was with the first sibling versus the second sibling versus the third sibling and it was correct and the three siblings thing is something I often pull out because it's you know, you never expect to go to an astrologer and for that to be the case. And so that's something I do quite routinely. And I'm thinking about a lady who came to me from a medical astrology reading yesterday. <laughs> and she and, and she she said, you know, I'm just gonna sit down. I'm not gonna say anything to you at all. I want you to, I want you to just tell me what you see in my chart. And the first thing that I saw within her chart was that she was probably based on the constitution of her chart, going to have urinary health problems, as well as problems with her bowels, problems with her bowel movements. And, and so I completely spoke about that for 30 minutes. And I said all the reasons why I thought that was the case. And I said, I, so I asked her, I said, you know, does any of this make sense to you? And she was like, it makes sense to me. The only thing that you got wrong was the fact that you said that my issue was constipation all my life. And it was actually di diarrhea all of my life. And the constipation only just became a thing. Oh. So, I mean, regardless, I mean, so sure. Yeah. Constipation and diarrhea are two different things, but at the same time to look at the person's chart and to be able to point out with any accuracy at all, where they're where their major health issue is okay so I got it wrong but I was in the yeah. right area yeah, and then so cool. and then the last thing I'll share is that I do a lot of my work is based on medical astrology research and when I was when I came into Iyengar yoga Dr. Lois Steinberg her work is really on the female reproductive system and using Iyengar yoga to help heal and treat and address female reproductive health issues because Iyengar yoga has we are very much keyed in or or tuned into people's holistic health needs as well and using Iyengar yoga as a means of helping to treat people while they're you know undergoing certain medical issues and so I've from a very early age I've been casted into a world of endometriosis and adenomyosis and dysmenorrhea and all of these female reproductive health issues and one of the things that I have taken a keen interest in is hysterectomies 
And hysterectomy is as a result of endometriosis. So I've done a sweeping astrological research study on, on women who've had hysterectomies as a result of endometriosis. And one of the people who I was interviewing a couple of weeks, probably a couple of months back at this point, not specifically for the hysterectomy study, but just for general medical astrology research. She had some liver problems. And so we were talking specifically about that. She she agreed to be a part of my research study. And then looking at her chart, I said, hey, I see something within your chart that I've seen a lot within my female reproductive health concerns. Have you ever had any female reproductive health issues along with the liver issues that you've had? In my mind, I was already thinking hysterectomy. And she said, no, I've always been healthy. My, my womb has always been healthy. I've never had any female reproductive health issues. So I said to her, just because I wanted to have it on record, because I didn't want it to be said that I said it after the fact, because I don't think anything is interesting after the fact. So I said to her, I said, okay, well, I'm seeing something within your chart that I've seen a lot within my endometriosis studies. And I'm just, and it's also a signature. And I don't think that this applies to you at all because I, you know, you never want to scare someone. So I said, I don't think this applies to you now, especially based on what you've said to me. But I have also seen this within a lot of my hysterectomy studies. So it's just a thought. And I'm just saying it. And, you know, if anything comes up for you around this, let me know. Literally one week after we had that conversation, she had to go to her doctor to get a checkup for her liver because. She, that's just something she has to do because she got a, a liver replacement. So she had to get a checkup on it. And after a battery of tests, the doctors found that she had precancerous cells growing within her uterus. And the doctor said to her that the best way to, you know, take care of the problem is for her to get a hysterectomy. And she sent me a Facebook message and she said, Michael, I'm only coming back to you because this is something you said to me two weeks ago. Never before in my life have I ever had any female reproductive health issues, but they said that they found this thing and it's been there for a while and they didn't catch wow. it before because before they were only focusing on my liver, but they found this thing and you're the one who said it first. Wow. So that's some stuff. <laughs> some, yes. uh, yeah, that's pretty incredible. Pretty amazing. So do you have, do you have time for a little bit more? Or we should sure be... sure okay. let's. <laughs> so in this line of of both, but in both lines of of planets, the importance of planets, and also the in the line of kind of controversial things. <laughs> so throughout in, in Jyotish and throughout traditional Western astrology, the nodes have been incredibly important. But in modern astrology, we don't really talk about them so much. But there are other planets like Uranus and Neptune which I, I kind of see as taking in some way the archetypical significations of the nodes, somewhat. But mm -hmm. in your practice, how have you used the nodes and the modern planets? And do you see them all as being useful or? Yeah. Yeah. The the nodes, I, I think, interestingly, the nodes have made a huge comeback in terms of evolutionary astrology. They highly use the nodes. They say that the North Node is where my soul is going and the South Node is where my soul came from or something to that effect. So modern astrology definitely uses the nodes to the nth degree. And it's kind of creepy for me because I just use them in that way. But I do use the nodes within a traditional Western perspective. And in traditional Western astrology, the nodes are very simple. The North Node is a point of increase. The South Node is a point of decrease. And that's how I use them. And that's the only way how I use them. The square to the north node represents something that we're challenged to grow around. The square to the south node represents something that we're challenged to sacrifice. That's all I know about the nodes. And that's all I say about the nodes. I mean, surely I know a lot more about the nodes. But when I teach, that's what I teach. Because that is where you will never go wrong. In traditional Western astrology, north node amplifies south node detracts if you keep that as your baseline for 60 years of astrological practice you'll never go wrong and you could add other things on top of that within the traditional western perspective but from a traditional western perspective that's all the nodes do they don't have the rich sort of meaning that we find them having in geotish and indian astrology i do use uranus neptune and pluto and and to the to the great disapproval of many of my traditional astrology colleagues who would rather say that 
they weren't a part of the sky the ancients saw 2,000 years ago, so why use them? Because we don't know enough about them. We discovered Uranus in the year 1781, we discovered Neptune in the year 1846, and we discovered Pluto in the year 1930. It's been a long time. We know enough about them. We've had we've had literally 300 years to know what Uranus does and to know what Uranus doesn't do. We know enough about Uranus. So I think it's a stupid argument in traditional Western astrology. I don't think they belong in Geotish. I think that Geotish functions quite wonderfully and quite well without the integration of the modern planets. And I think that that makes complete sense within Indian astrology. Within traditional Western astrology, there are a lot of people who refuse to use them as well. And I really saw how many people refuse to use them during the pandemic when we had the Saturn, Pluto, Jupiter, South Node conjunction in Capricorn in the beginning of January 2020. And then the whole world went to shit after that. And I saw, I was surprised at how many of my colleagues were trying to find everything else to talk about other than the fact that there was a Saturn-Pluto conjunction because they refused to acknowledge that Pluto does anything. And I mean, it's fine if, if once again, whatever floats your boat, but I practice, and I can only speak about what I practice. I don't know what other people practice. I practice rigorously, painstaking, high quality, risky, astrology. I practice astrology with no strings attached. I'll give somebody a reading of their chart for an entire hour and say the most concrete things in the world about their mother, their father, their brother, their everyone. And I use Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And so the people who I find having arguments against using Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto aren't people who I've ever seen practice astrology like that. So I tend not to care when I hear, what's his face? I'm not going to call anybody's name, but I tend not to care when I hear so many people talking about all the reasons they don't use Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, because I don't, I can't really point a finger at anyone in the West who I've ever seen give a reading like me in my life. And Judith is amazing. She's wonderful. She uses Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Nicholas Smuts Altop is amazing. She's wonderful. She uses Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And still, I, I can't really identify not one practitioner in the West who yeah. demonstrates astrology in the way that I do. So I think that I have an opinion that matters. And my opinion is that Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto work. They're not the rulers of signs of the zodiac, but they definitely, definitely, definitely work, especially if they're a major hard aspect to something, especially if they're a conjunct and angle, especially, 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 like the list goes on. But I mean, to, to hold out in the year 2023 that we're not going to use Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto because they don't, because we don't know what they do, I think it's a, I think it's a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a flawed argument because we do know what they do. And that's just my opinion about it. I also, I, I find the significance of, of using the, the, at least Uranus and, and, and Neptune and Pluto sometimes, depending on the orb, the orb I think is pretty cru crucial because just in the same way that the North node and the South node, you can't see with your naked eye <laughs> mm -hmm. I've been used for this entire time you you can't see them but they're definitely there <laughs> yeah yeah i i think i mean there's there's that argument as well in astrology that if you can see it then you know it's not a thing you can't see your ascendant your ascendant right. is a mathematical calculation in space you can't see your midheaven your midheaven is a mathematical calculation in space but they're two of the most important places within your chart also, I mean, for a very long time, I was very anti-Chiron. <clears throat> I was absolutely anti-Chiron. I thought that it was the stupidest thing floating around in space. And I was like, why do so much people put so much weight on Chiron? I thought it was so dumb. And then, <laughs> and then I started, uh, for some reason, I was giving a presentation and Chiron was on this chart I was presenting from. I don't even know how it got there because I never have that on charts. And it was conjunct this lady's moon. And she had the most harrowing and the most horrific story I had ever heard anybody have about their about her mother, and and it was just this awful, this very toxic, chaotic maternal story. And then somebody else came who had Chiron square their moon, and it was this awful, chaotic, toxic mother story. And then somebody else came who had Chiron opposite their moon. And then when, I mean, one of the things that happens as astrologers is that if you tell the universe that you're open to exploring something, it sends you 20 people with the same thing. Right. And, so true. And so 20 people came to me who all had this 
Moon Chiron square, Moon Chiron semi square, Moon Chiron sesqui quadrate, Moon Chiron parallel, Moon Chiron antitia, Moon Chiron contra antitia. All of these hard aspect relationships with Moon and Chiron, and they all sound the same. My mother didn't want kids. My mother never loved me. My mother couldn't produce breast milk, and so she fed me grits. My mother had a condition that she didn't have breast milk. My mother said she was going to kill herself. My mother was on horse tranquilizers. My mother, my my mother, my mother, my mother. And so I and so I've I've built a case study on Moon Chiron as a thing. And I told Judith about it just tangentially. And she was like, wow, you know, that sounds accurate based on charts that I know where people have Moon Chiron as a contact. And so I think that as astrologers, and for me as an astrologer, I'm far more concerned with doing what works within the framework of still holding on to rigorously traditional rules. And my use of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, sometimes Chiron, in very specific cases, doesn't usurp the fact that I am still a born and bred traditional astrologer. And I think that <clears throat> there's a lot of people within our community, other traditional astrologers, who feel threatened by the notion of anybody writing a book and calling it Mastering Traditional Astrology and Using Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And once again, while I don't care in general, I think that I think that we have to know that there's more things in heaven and earth than we can see or that we can understand. And as astrologers, we should keep ourselves open to that because all of us, no matter whether we're traditional or non-traditional or geotish or whatever, all of us are practicing something that for the majority of the world shouldn't even work to begin with. So, you know, where does one weird person go pointing fingers at another weird person for being too weird? You know, if if it works, if it works and it works emphatically well, then it works. And that's just the bottom line for me. Yeah. I would disagree with you though. The the most of the world, I think most of the industrialized Western world, but I think in the world, astrology is still, you know, magic is still is still known. Mm -hmm. <laughs> still mm -hmm. because it does work. It just yeah. goes against the the dogma of of industrial yeah. material reductionist that is true that is true <laughs> ideas i haven't seen one person with moon neptune and hard aspect who doesn't have extreme food allergies i right. haven't seen one person with venus pluto in hard aspect i haven't seen one woman with venus pluto in hard aspect who doesn't have some deeply troubling story about her female reproductive health and that could be either that her breasts grew to a, an extreme rate when she was 12 years old and she was teased every single day of her life at 12 years old because she had the largest breasts in the school not just in her class but in the school at the age of 12 or that she had polycystic ovarian syndrome or an endometrioma which is a tumor growing with within within the uterus i mean there there are all of these things and and while these are i think it's reckless to just say that in isolation because there's clearly other things within the chart that have right. to corroborate that have to corroborate that so i want to preface this by saying no one thing within a chart will do something by itself there has to be multiple factors that are tying in and that corroborate and that say yes this is the thing that's happening however more often than not people who have more neptune and hard aspect have awful have awful what's the word called food allergies more yeah. often than not women who have venus pluto in any hard aspect combination especially if mars is there especially if the moon is involved have very troubling stories surrounding their female reproductive system and so more often than not men who have a weak venus from a traditional astrology perspective that's also squared by uranus have an erratic sperm count so i i don't for me within my house at the oraculo school of astrology i don't really have a time to 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 and, and not even within the context of our conversation because i'm loving this but i just mean in general for the larger traditional astrology community i don't have time 
to argue with people about the effectiveness or the or the non-effectiveness of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto because I practice concrete event-based astrology. I don't practice psychological astrology where I'm going to talk to you about your emotions for an hour. I practice concrete event-based astrology where I describe what are the events that have occurred within your life, what are the very clear medical conditions that might be as a result of some of the combinations you have within your chart, and it works. So, I mean, I mean, yeah, try it. You, you can't deny it. When, it. when <laughs> if Chiron gets your attention, you know, if Chiron wants to speak with you and says, "Hey, I exist," mm. then you, you can't deny that. And and that's yeah. where within the tradition, when you when you're a working astrologer and you're getting these cases, that's how you get the significations. That's how you figure out what what things mean. So, yeah, and I and I, I hate it. I mean, I personally hate it. <laughs> yeah, I would I would much prefer a world within which. Chiron didn't do anything so that I could continue to laugh at people who use Chiron in their <laughs> astrology. I, I hate the fact that I have seen time and time again this awful maternal story with people who have mourned Chiron in hard aspect because I would like to have an astrology with a very with a very small sky. I would like to shrink the sky to suit my needs and to suit, and to suit my rhetoric about mm -hmm. traditional astrology. I would love to never use Chiron. I would love to never <laughs> use Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, but I can't. And I can't not because I've been I'm bound by some modern astrological creed that says I need to use them. I can't because what because they they show up in a way that is unmistakable within medical astrology cases, within people who've had traumatic life experiences. They show up, they show up, they show up. I haven't met a person who has Uranus conjunct the ascendant or Uranus conjunct their IC who isn't from a house of divorce whose parents didn't divorce I haven't really met that many people who have Uranus in the seventh who also themselves haven't had a divorce I haven't met that many people who have I mean it just goes on and on and on so I mean right, right. I, I can't I oi. It's, yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. so this Hilarious. has been a, a really amazing conversation so great. before we <laughs> finish up yeah, where can people find you and find all your book and your courses and everything like that? Awesome. So if anybody wants to find me, you can find me at oraculosastrology.com. That's O-R-A-C-U-L-O-S, oraculosastrology.com. The name of my school is the Oraculo School of Astrology. You can find my book on Amazon. And once again, this is it, Mastering Traditional Astrology. It's volume one of a very large number of books that I plan to write before I die. <laughs> and so you can find it on Amazon at the moment. And very soon you'll be able to find it in bookstores everywhere, which is my hope by the end of this year. And if you want to be in contact, please shoot me an email at hello at oraculosastrology.com because I would love to be in contact with you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Michael. Yeah, thank you, Michael. It was so nice yeah. chatting with you. Yeah, congrats thank on the book. Thank you so much, AC. Yeah, thank you so much, Isaac. <laughs>